Welcome to the Move the Chains podcast. I'm your host, Jason Jacoby, here with my co-host, Mark Boyer. Sometimes we go by salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. (laughs) Spice of life. Exactly. But we have a special one for you today. And uh, a fellow Trojan for Mark. So uh, this is is quite exciting for us. Caitlin Sandeno, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks, guys. I'm excited to be with you both. Well, we're AJ, really AJ, 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 don't worry if you kind of fade out during the deal because you got two SC alums here, man. So you may not, I know. You may not be That's like, all right. I'm all a right? Trojan at heart. You know, my okay, sister there went go. there. So I grew up a Trojan fan. So um, <laughs> if you guys can adopt me for the day, then, okay. then I think we're on right there. <laughs> Honorary Trojan. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, you go. For the exactly. Day. I'm honored. I'm honored to be here with the two of you. But Caitlin, so, all right. So former competition swimmer, Olympic gold medalist. On top of Ooh. silvers and bronzes as well, world champion, former world record holder, four by two hundred uh, freestyle uh, relay, incredible, incredible accomplishments. Again, thanks for being here. But um, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about your past? Obviously, you grew you grew up uh, El Toro High School, Mission Viejo area, right? So, how did your love of swimming start? Well, you know, I was a water baby from the start. Couldn't even get me out of the bathtub. And I have two older sisters with a pretty good age difference between us of 11 and 13 years. So I was going Mm -hmm. to my first swim meet like a week (laughs) into this world because my sister had a swim meet and I was just poolside with my mom. Got my first uh, sunburn at a young age at my first, you know, my sister's swim meets and just being the younger sister that was just being dragged to everything. Uh, but really it was the, the love for the summer league program. I think the summer league sports for swimming are just so important because it's that first real kind of touch in the pool and the taste of the sport and um, really feeling out if you have talent, you know, swimming's not for everybody. It is a challenging sport, but what swimming yeah. is good for everybody, it's a life skill. So if you fall in a lake, if you fall out of a boat, if you're at the beach, if you're at a birthday party with a pool, and if you're a child or if you fall in the pool, swimming's a life skill. Uh, So I think, you know, really, especially where we're from in Southern California, I think being on a swim team is a little bit more common. But when you go into other, you know, neck of the woods that don't have the weather that we have or the pool accessibility that we have or, you know, the, the, the means to be on a swim team, I just can't stress enough the importance of just learning how to swim you know so i think that's where swimming differs from other sports i mean obviously being a football player is an incredible sport and you have to be an incredible athlete to do it but it's not a life skill you know being a swimmer Mm -hmm. that is a life skill um but having said that you know i was a huge tomboy my parents put me in everything i love sports i did every sport you can imagine i took a liking to soccer and cross country the most um i'd actually say swimming was maybe like my third favorite i love 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 soccer i really really that was that was my jam um, but I was Ooh. pretty petite and um, short and skinny for my age. And uh, I was also very aggressive. And I just found myself on the ground a lot and getting hurt a lot. And my swim coaches were like, well, maybe we should go a little bit easier on the soccer. Um, my, my swim coaches <laughs> saw talent and they were a little bit more vocal than I would say my soccer coaches. I was probably just as good at mm-hmm. soccer, um, if not like the same, um, like kind of just level wise. Uh, but it was my swim coaches that really instilled their belief in me and, and approached myself and my parents, you know, telling them, I think she could be really great if she focused on one sport. So I did that in junior high and then things kind of took off okay. from there. Oh. Wow. So you had, you had older sisters that were swimmers, uh, your parents, did they have a background in swimming? Like how'd you guys all the girls no, get into my swimming? My mom was a figure skater. Um, my dad went to Northern Arizona university and he was the generation where, uh, he was just intramural sports and played it uh, for yeah. his fraternity. And, uh, uh, when I go to some of his uh, frat boy gatherings, they tell me how fast and how strong my dad was. So I feel like that's where some of my genes came from. Um, I'm pretty decent figure skater, but nothing like my mom yeah. was, um, <laughs> But yeah, I wouldn't say like, you know, they weren't playing in college and they didn't have an athletic career to that sort. And my sisters did summer league. And then in high school, they chose um, cheerleading and drill team. So a little bit different routes there, but to yeah, their, own, yeah. their calling. And um, I would just say like, my parents have always been just big um, advocators for, for sports to so get them in something, keep them out of trouble. Yeah. 
burn their energy. I had a ton of energy. Um, and also because of our age difference, it wasn't like I was growing up really close to a sibling. So being on yeah. a team kind of gave me like my playmates and the play dates and uh, things to that degree. So um, just being like within that community of sports is really important to my parents. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's cool. That your parents saw that sport. I think that's really important with sports. You know, um, I've got, you know, we have five, my, my wife and I have five children and all married now. And now I got a bunch of grandkids and, um, you know, all of, uh, including Jason's got a couple of them, yeah. uh, but they're, you know, just seeing just the other day, watching his oldest uh, boy, just be involved in sports and kind of active that way. I think there's so many life lessons to learn from sports, you know, Absolutely. um, yeah. and, in the ways to find your passion and what you like doing, uh, even if it ends up being, you play a little bit and you don't like it, then at least, yeah. you know, you, you know, you, there's something else, right? Absolutely. I just think obviously being in a team sport, I think that provides all like a lot of social skills and skills that will adapt as adults into the workforce. Uh, but just being yeah. active, like it's funny because my I have two older sisters as I shared and my oldest sister has four boys and her boys really didn't do organized sports, but they're either on a surfboard or on a skateboard every day or on a mountain bike, yeah, you know, yeah. so they're in that, yeah. the, the less traditional sport, but they're just active and they're at the beach for like six hours and they come home and they're just toasted. Their energy has gone, you know, so just that promoting that active life lifestyle. And obviously I didn't really grow up in the generation with like tons of gadgets and gadgets and electronics, but I mean, we obviously had Nintendo and the, that, that was like, yeah. the generation <laughs> coming up, but that was not a part of our lifestyle at all. And, and I think I had a game boy just because we have long drives to soccer tournaments and swim meets are long. And that's like the one time I would like play game boy. So just not mm. having that technology distraction or interruptions and, and just getting Kids in sports. And I mean, my husband and I don't have children, but just, I just like to preach to parents like, and have them do multiple sports. Like I'm hearing yeah. crazy stories of these parents that are so intense for one sport at a young age. It's like, why? Like what for? Mm. Like you're going to burn them out or it, it's just, it's to me, that's really sad. Like I was talking to a good girlfriend who was a successful athlete herself and her husband was an Olympian. And she's like, this is crazy. Like kids are like seven years old and they're full-time sports with private coaches and doing other like you know multiple leagues within their sport and I, it's just like mind-blowing to me i'm like well i played soccer two days a week i swim two days a week at a cross country a day and whatever was on the right. weekend either swimming or soccer game i was changing in the car from one sport to the other you know and i did oh. that up until eighth grade and obviously it's like that's what worked for me but i just I, I really believe in that and recently i posted on my social media a couple of the different sports i did and the mom's like thanks for sharing this i think it's so important for people to see like you didn't just dedicate to one sport at a young yeah. age so like no I, I guess i was like a late start for that and Reach it. I, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent. i mean i think that in my generation going way back i mean we always you know you played you played all sports i mean pretty yeah. much everything and then you know watching my kids and now the grandkids i see that focus and uh Besides the financial services business here that we're involved with, we're a financial, but I'm part owner of a gym, actually fast mm. twitch here in Orange County. But we were talking about that and we see what happens is with, with athletes, when they just play one sport, one of the challenges there, and you'll know this because you were swimming, right? When you just do the same motion over and over again, all the time, your body gets out of balance. You're, you're prone right. to injuries. There's right. lots of things that can happen. So I think that, you know, like you're talking about well-rounded and getting, you know, using different sports and you know different muscles and different sports you know it really helps you build athleticism which is really important so i see kind of honestly i think now you kind of see sort of a switch back you see it slowly coming back to i seen more kids young you know more parents putting in multiple sports we'll see if that plays out but i think that's i agree with you 100 percent. that's uh, really important they're really good cross training for each other too it's like my soccer yeah. my See my swimming help my soccer and like you said that risk of repetition and it's like and swimming is a very repetitive sport as it is um and yeah. so to help with the burnout because you see that so much too you know kids are just you know thriving as they're so young and then they get to high school and they're like i'm so sick of this i did so much as a kid and that's really sad and i saw this terrible stat the other day that um that the percentage of kids that were in, in, enrolled in youth sports from the ages from 6 to 12 was 37 percent like oh, that, that was, it was yeah. heartbreaking. And, you know, we have to fact check that. I, you know, not quite sure where they got all that, but they're showing the decline yeah. in registration for that age. It's like, well, what are they doing? If they're like, what are you doing now? You don't have to be great. Like you just need to be active. Yeah. Like, what are they doing after school? Well, they're mm. playing game. A lot of them are playing games on, on the TV, yeah. right? That's their That's exercise. Right. I don't think it's working. You know, child obesity is really super high now. And, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's not a good trend. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. So, so Caitlin, I got to ask, so, so speaking of uh, moving from multi-sport to, to being a, a single sport athlete after eighth grade, do you think, so for parents out there maybe, or, or other athletes, like, so when do you think is a good time to kind of have that singular focus? Is it a, a single moment that you had, you were kind of like, oh yeah, like this is my, this is my thing, I think. And I'm just going to put, you know, hundred percent effort into this and go after it. It's a great question because really looking back, I wish I would have done multiple sports in high school. Um, I, I tried out for the cross country team going into my freshman year and I made it. But it was really, it was really my coaches. They're like, "Nah, we really don't need you in that." Like my swim coaches are like, "I think it's time," yeah. um, <laughs> you know. So that's hard to say. And I think too, like you see, like for boys sports, there's like a great crossover between like basketball and football, or you know, baseball yeah. and football. It's like if the seasons I'll allow it. I'd be like, "Go for it," you know. But um, I think you get into these sports with these coaches that are pretty persistent on getting you into their, you know, their sport full time. Um, I think you have to let the body mature and develop and grow. Um, and I think too, like we change so much. So how do you get to know what you're good or what you like if you don't try things, you know, and, and that's even just goes yeah. with the sport of swimming. Like, you know, I, I was a breaststroker when I started, but our coaches had us race everything. And everybody's like, oh, why am I doing that? I'm not good at that. You never know until you try, you know, and then Brusher became my worst stroke. And then I was a distance freestyler and butterfly, you know? So it's just like, as you're developing and your body changes and you go from, you know, 12 years old and underweight and undersized, and then you go through puberty and you're at your full, you know, strength, so much changes. So, um, got a long winded <laughs> answer to that. Jason is it's hard no, to I say like it. it's so individual. Yeah. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and I, I do think your skill level speaks for itself too. Like, yep. are you going to make it to college sports? Are you going to make it to the Olympics? You know, so then maybe you need to start a little bit. Are you going to be pretty good and you could do multiple sports Then do all multiple sports? You know, if you're not going to mm -hmm. be at the LA 2028 Olympics, then, no. you know, maybe <laughs> Yeah, it's not for everyone, you know? So I, I just think that there's a lot, that's a very a deep rooted question. <laughs> Yeah, no, I like that. I think that's a lot of people. I mean, I know a lot of athletes or parents that have athletes that try to force them into one thing when they're young. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not, you know, uh, a malicious intent. Obviously, they want their kids to excel yeah. and their kid loves it and they want to be the best. But like you said, having that kind of cross sport um, athleticism and being mm -hmm. balanced or, you know, there's a lot of correlation between you know, lateral speed or, you know, agility that can actually translate into a lot of different things. So I, I really like that answer. Thanks for, for, uh, for answering it so well. Um, but, but let's, let's get into, so let's get into college. Okay. So El Toro high school focused on swimming was SC like always growing up in Southern California, right? It's like USC or UCLA. Uh, so was it always SC or were yeah. there other schools that were kind of vying for you at the time too? SD in the sense that um, I am very close with my family. And it was funny because I, I had a wonderful high school experience. I just swam, but I was really involved in school as class president, you know, as homecoming queen. I made my first Olympic team in high school, you know, so I um, had success oh. while I was in high school. I was going into, I had just finished my junior year of high school, made it that summer, and then was going into my senior year. So I was like two weeks late to senior year of high school because I was coming back from the Olympics. So things were a little surreal, so surreal at that time. Um, and wow. I don't feel like I really went through that phase where a lot of my fellow seniors did. were like, I can't wait to get out of here. can't wait to go to college. Like I for sure got senior. I just was school, but like I got along <laughs> so great with my parents. My sisters just lived down the way. I had nephews at that time already. It was just like, I don't leave the nest. Like I'm really happy here, you know? And so SU was, um, it was very attractive to me for many reasons, but one of them was it was really close to home. And yeah, you mentioned the other crosstown rival at UCLA, but they didn't have a men's <laughs> program. And um, swimming is a very co-ed sport and I train really well with men. They really push me. I'm very competitive. So I knew I wanted to be in a co -ed, on a co-ed team. Um, and that does um, kind of weed out some teams too, because even if a program has a men's and women's program, they don't always train together. So USC, they did. Men and women trained together. Mm. And I really liked that. Um, at that time, I thought I would go into like broadcasting or wanted to be in journalism. So Annenberg School is so amazing at USC. Um, I liked that mm. it was a private school. And I, um, 
I really liked the coach. I knew the head coach there had an amazing reputation. He was actually one of the um, head coaches for the Olympic team in 2000. So I got to be mm. around him in his environment and his aura and train with him. Um, it was kind of, you know, it was like a legal early recruiting trip, just being on the yeah, Olympics yeah. to see what he was like yeah. and to be his presence. And I really like um, how he motivated me and how he spoke to the team. Um, and then my club, so my club coach swam underneath the USC coach. So I knew the program wow. I knew it would be similar. Um, I just knew it was a good fit for me. He specialized in events. I swam. And so USC was pretty much a slam dunk for me, but um, I did take recruiting trips. Uh, I was blessed to basically go wherever I wanted to on a full ride scholarship. I was the top recruit um, in the nation that year. So um it was a, it was an amazing blessing to have. Um, I always said, my, you know, joke that my parents loved me no matter what for swimming, but they loved me a little bit more knowing I was getting that full ride. <laughs> so that was <laughs> a financial burden <laughs> off of them. And really that was when I was in high school, like the goal that I gave myself was like swim really fast so you can go to college because I knew the mm -hmm. financial situation that my parents were in. I wasn't going to be able to go to USC without, you know, yeah. some type of scholarship. Um, and so that was my motivation or my goal in high school was swim really fast and get a scholarship. And so, um, you know, amazing things happened trying to attain that goal and that goal came true. And so, yeah, I went into uh, SC as, um, you know, my freshman year as an Olympian already and uh, my top recruit. So there was some pressure going into that, but <laughs> uh, I had a yeah. well, but I was uh, burdened with injuries as soon as I got there. So college is a little bit. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> there had to be some, uh, that's a, that's, that's uh injury. So it's part of, you know, part of sports, right. Is managing your injuries. That's tough because look at your situation. You're at high school, right. And then you're going to the Olympics as a 17 year old. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> And really, and did incredible. I mean, you you did the medal, the bronze medal in the eight hundred freestyle meter freestyle event, fourth place in the four hundred meter individual medley, and sixth place in the two hundred meter butterfly. So there's a lot of expectations probably going on for you going into SC. And then yeah. you just said it, you just nailed it, right? Talking about move the chains, you know, not it, all of a sudden, boom, you get sacked, and you're you know you're you're yes. uh, you know you're second in and 15 instead of first and, you know, or second and 10 or four, you know, I mean, you're, you're backed up. So how'd you handle those injuries, Kaylin? What, how did, how did that, you know, with mentally, was that tough for you? Yeah, absolutely. Cause like you said, like I was moving the chains really well in high school. Like everything was just smooth, great, awesome blessing. Like every time I swam, I was like, wow, a record. Wow. First, like <laughs> yeah. it was real. And it wasn't like I wasn't training hard, but it was, it was easy. Like, it, it, and I say that like after you know, swimming six hours a day, going to bed early and all the nutrition, but it, it things just smooth, was very smooth. Um, and then you go to, I went to SC as, you know, kind of the spotlight on me onto the, the swim team and shoulder injury right off the bat, back injury right off mm. the bat. And it was like, mm. and fumble, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it, was, um, it was tough because it was very humbling. Um, and Look, swimming's hard. It's boring. It's a lot of hours in the pool. You're like waterlogged all the time. And I was like, I don't, do I even want to do this anymore? You know, I'm like my shoulder hurts. Mm -hmm. I already went to the Olympics. Yeah, I've started off the season sitting on the bench and it was really frustrating. And on mm -hmm. top of it all, it's like, I'm going to USC. Like my grades were terrible. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was getting into academically. Um, you know, the freshman 15, I easily put on freshman, like 20, 25. Like it was just like, <laughs> oh my God. It was like sack, fumble, interception, yeah, sack, fumble, interception. Yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is tough. Um, and then, you know, that's where, that's where I, you, I don't know, you just make that decision. And I was like, okay, I could not have been at the pinnacle at 17 years old. You know, there's way too yeah. much more to go. And it was that decision that like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to set the goal to make another Olympics. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but let's mm -hmm. not give up yet. You know? And it's like, I can't really explain what it's like going to the Olympics still after all these years, it's pretty hard to really articulate I mean, all I can say is once you go once, you want to go again, you know, and it's going to be mm, hard for me to yeah. my couch and watch Paris because every year I'm like, oh, I wish I was there. I wish I was competing. <laughs> um, 
It's just, yeah. there's nothing like it to represent your country, to be in that type of environment, to be at the pinnacle of your sport. I mean, it's so surreal. So getting a taste of that. And I was so young when I went too. I didn't even really know what I was doing. It was like my second ever international competition. And the one that I went to previously was, you know, pretty mild compared to. So it was almost like deer in headlights for my first Olympics. I'm like, if I went to the second Olympics, there's so much more that I could do better. Uh, and so, yeah. you know, it's just, it's mind over matter. I, I truly believe that the, the body believes what the mind, the, the body achieves what the mind believes. And it's just yeah. like what you put in your head, your body's going to listen to. And I mean, it takes, it takes a village too. Like I, I, I say a lot that yes, I have four Olympic medals, but they're not mine. There's so many people that helped me get to that part. You know, I got to stand on the podium and I got to put it on. I did that work, but for, for my coaches, my trainers, my parents, my support staff. I mean, it truly does take a village and, and people just that help me get through those obstacles. And it's a mind game. It really is. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of great athletes out there that have all the physical attributes to be the best, but it really comes down to who mentally can, can handle it, who mentally can yeah. get the done and who can mentally do it when they do go through those fumbles interception sacks you know who can get back yeah. up you know catch the ball and, and keep running um and so i feel like that's something that i really appreciate about sports is how resilient it makes you and how determined it makes you and, and it makes you tough you know I, and, and and i see that in you know, I, I feel like I am very feminine, but I definitely have a very tough side to me. And that's just from getting over those obstacles and, and pushing through. Yeah. So I'm curious, and maybe there wasn't, but I know for me, when times like that, you know, where you have hard times, uh, you know, where there, where there are people, um, you said, you said you talked, you know, it takes a village or, you know, other people around you that helped you get there. I'm curious in that hard time for you. Mm -hmm. Um, was your mom and dad? I mean, there had to be some people that were like encouraging you along the way, right? Um, yes, absolutely. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah. That hard so time? my head coach at USC was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But, you know, I, I felt like a total letdown. I was like, I was the top recruit in the nation and I wasn't doing anything for him. You know, wasn't scoring a lot of points. Wasn't winning NC2A titles. I mean, still did okay. You know, I, the fact that I was even at NC2As with the year that I had, I, looking back on it was pretty impressive. Um, but he was very determined to to get me to all the right doctors. Cause for a long time, nobody knew it was wrong with my back. And we, it was like a wild goose chase. And, you know, some coaches could have just wrote me off and be like, Oh, she's probably faking it. Like, she's just trying to like, figure, yeah. you know, get out of the sport. And he was just very determined. Like we'll go to every doctor in LA, every doctor at USC. Um, and then finally just, he sent me home the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. Usually at USC, you stay and you train on the um, summer league program or the summer league and you go to school. And I took that summer off. I came home, came to Orange County, and my physical therapist in Orange County was phenomenal. I mean, he gave up his lunch breaks to take me to the pool. And it was it was basically, I, I started all over from scratch swimming, just getting yeah. in and doing two laps, you know, and he literally gave up his lunch break to, to do that with me. Um, so I would say, you know, my head coach, my trainer, or my physical therapist, Nick Theaters, and then, and my parents, I mean, just being coming back home and staying with them in Orange yep. County and, um, you know, dealing with my mood swings and dealing with my emotions and, um, dealing with me trying to sort out, like, what is it that I even am trying, do I want to keep doing this, you know, and just, mm. they're just always so positive and they were like, never on me about swimming, you know, like, they did the hard work. They took me to practice, but ultimately they're like, this is your decision. You know, it wasn't them no, trying to live no. my care stay through me, uh, but just like my biggest supporters and something I always love to share in every single podcast. Sorry if you've ever already heard me say this, but you know, my parents, I truly believe a lot of my success comes from my parents always giving me that sense of being unconditionally loved because I knew no. my work mm -hmm. wasn't determined off of my first or my world record or breaking a record, I knew no matter what, as long as I was showing up in the world as a good person, my parents were going to be proud of me. And it wasn't about my swimming um, stardom that was my worth or my love. So my parents' unconditional love just always made me feel secure to just go out there and never be able to fail. Because like, if you mess up one race, it's like, whatever, you have like a million more to go. And just having like that big picture, like what life is all about. And my parents just always preach like, and be a nice girl and be a nice girl. I was like, have fun, kick butt and be a nice girl. And I was like, I'm yeah. 40s now. My, I'm like, my mom's like, have fun, be safe, be a nice girl. Like, that's like our family. <laughs> 
Um, so just having that <laughs> sense great. of unconditional love from my parents is, I, I truly believe, where a lot of my success came from. No, I love that. That is that is so. I mean, yeah. I hope every every parent yeah. with kids in sports hears that uh, because that is so important. I try to do the same with my kids, and and it's. Uh, I think it's so important for us as parents to love our kids for who they are, not for what we think they're going to do to fulfill our, you know, our sports fantasies or the things that didn't happen for us as parents, right? right. Um, and you know, you see that all the time. You see it crazy in these my, my grandkids' sport. I'm like. What is wrong with these people? Yeah. I mean, chill, take a, you know, just relax. I mean, right. you know, the kid is, you know, eight, 10 years old. I mean, just, I mean, what is wrong? You know, so that is so important for parents to hear. And the other thing I, I grab out of that, Caitlin, I think is, um, and I would encourage anybody, it, you know, as we get older, we're not involved in sports. We may not be coaching. I think coaching, I think coaches have the most influential impact on kids more than even parents. I mean, you spent so much time with your, your coaches at that time, you know, obviously your SC coach and they had a huge impact, but you know, they're, you know, looking at our lives now, we're, if we're not in coaching, you know, or whatever, you know, I think it's what you said there. It's really important for us to, if there's somebody in our lives who needs some encouragement, it may not be sports, but we all need that encouraging uh, word, you know, to keep us going and, uh, you know, to help us direct our, I think it's really important to have people like that in your life. So be that person today. If you're listening to this podcast, find somebody you can encourage. I think it's so important. And I that's think a great example of what you said. It's like parents should parent and coaches should coach. And there needs to be yeah. no overlap. You know, and that was another thing too. Like my parents didn't know anything about swimming. So I wasn't coming in after a race, like, oh, I, you know, I think you went into that turn a little slow. You know, I, as I was in the sport longer, they obviously became more educated in the sport, but they weren't like giving me these tips or like, you know, and I think that would probably be challenging if you have children and you were in the sport, like how to keep your mouth shut, but like learn how to do it, you know, because it's yeah. just like, yeah. I think it, so it, important. it just keeps everybody in their lane, you know? And it's like, you know, my parents weren't like, Oh, on that 500 freestyle, I think we're fourth 100 could have been faster. I would have been like, what? You know? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't like that. It's like, Hey, what do you want for dinner? Like, should we go get Dairy Queen? Like, it was just like, yeah. <laughs> I just think that's really important too. It's like you have coaches for a reason. Um, obviously there are some unique situations and I see it like in football all mm. kinds of time and you're on the, you're on the team with your dad coaching or whatnot or in youth sports. Um, but when you get to that level where there is a coach, that's not you, you don't need to put in your two cents. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're talking a little bit about, about SC, your experience. Um, and so you're on the, the alumni board for, for House of Victory, right? NIL, the, the NIL uh, wing of, of SC Athletics, right? Yeah. So back when we were all playing our sports, there was no NIL. There was no name, image, likeness, making money legally <laughs> on, <laughs> on, uh, on your name, image, or likeness, right? So... I mean, it's a it's an incredible time to to be able to monetize. Obviously, as an athlete, you know the amount of hours. Like that's your job. Like in college, like you're not doing anything but school, and even sometimes that's a stretch because you're there. You're on a full ride. You know, you got to maintain your grades to be able to maintain your scholarship. But you really, you got to perform on the field or in the pool or you know on the court, whatever it may be. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the current NIL ruling and, and is it a good thing? Or does it need to be ironed out a little bit more or is this something that, uh, that can really benefit, you know, not just football, right. Which has got the most scholarships, but obviously kind of spreading the love around a little bit too, to maybe beach volleyball, swimming, whatever it may be. That's a great question. And I'll try not to get too long winded in this. Um, First off, I had to give up my last year of eligibility at USC to take money. So I actually only competed mm -hmm. for USC my freshman, sophomore, and junior year. And looking back on my college uh, you know, accomplishments, I would say I only had one really great year at USC, my junior year after I was healed and recovered and finally won two NC2A titles and broke my first American record. But like my freshman, sophomore year was just like hurt, hurt, dead average. So going into the 2004 Olympics fell between that summer of my junior year and my senior year and the opportunity for swimmers to make money, very slim to, to none. And it has to be a sweet spot and it's always going into the Olympics. So I was faced with this decision, you know, like, do I take the money or do I take my full ride scholarship? Um, and it was hard and it was sad for me to have been, to even be in that situation. 
but those were the rules and I play by the rules and I, you know, I took the opportunity. I, I struck when the iron was hot and I gave up my last year of eligibility. I signed with Nike. Uh, but part of my scholarship with Nike was look like I'm, I'm giving up this scholarship. And it was my dad who was like, they should have to pay for that too, you know? So thank mm-hmm. you, Nike, for finishing my education for me. Um, having said that, <laughs> NIL is here. If you like it or yeah. you don't like it, it doesn't matter. It's here. So I have my own personal thoughts on it. And it doesn't yeah. matter what they are because it's already here and we either get on board or your programs are just all going to suffer. Um, as you asked, Jason, does it need to be ironed out? Yes. I really think they opened Pandora's box um, and now they're trying to backtrack a little bit, but it's like, well, you already did are allowing this. So now what are you going to do? So right. my role with House of Victory, um, I feel a sense of pride with because as US, as I've been more removed from USC swimming, uh, the programs changed, the coaches have changed. So I haven't really felt kind of that um, sorority with that team because the programs changed so much. I don't know the coaches. I don't have the relationship. But I'm always mm-hmm. a very strong and passionate Trojan. So being a part of House of Victory, I feel like I'm a part of the greater good for the school. And being with all these legends in all different sports, what we're really trying to do is use our platform to educate people. Because a lot of people mm-hmm. here in I think it's a bad word or it's, or it's, um, dirty or it's illegal. And so, you know, I have a lot of people in Newport beach that are donors, but they're like, no, I'm putting my money here. I would never do NIL. That's just, that's not right. It's corrupt. It's like, no, let me educate you more where your money's going. You know, those really expensive season tickets you have to USC football. Do you want to sit in those seats as we're good and winning? Or do you want all those top recruits to go to other schools that offer more NIL and you're sitting in your seats watching USC lose, you know? So it's like, You either need to get on board with it and support trying to bring the best recruits you can to your school because you're going to lose athletes to the schools with more NIL opportunities. Do I agree with that? Doesn't matter. You know, so it's it's being a part of um, House of Victory and learning a lot. Um, I feel like, you know, for me, I'm just a proud Trojan and I love going to football games and I love when we win. So I want us to have a strong NIO program. But yes, I do hope this goes to multiple sports. And I've bridged, you know, a, um, a nonprofit with House of Victory that I hope to get swimmers involved in. There's a lot of different interesting angles. And look, the swim team is not bringing in a lot of money for USC. I know that. But there's still athletes that give so much time and so much energy. And we're still, we're trying to build that program. It hasn't been great for years. Right now they're in, off to a great yeah. start. But it's like, we need to spread that wealth out. And we need to spread it out to women's sports too. But we also need to be realistic. Mm-hmm. What brings in the most sport for USC? Most money for USC? Football. Now basketball is getting up there. So we really need to get behind those programs. I mean, I think Lincoln Riley has straight up said, like, I will leave if we don't have a strong NIL program because he can't compete. Mm -hmm. When you have like SMU, that's just like shelling out the money to these kids. They're going to go there, even if they're not that, you know, not that strong, you know, so it's very, uh, it's very complex. I'm learning a lot. It's been, um, I'm very proud to be a part of it. Like when I'm on these phone calls with like these USC legends, I'm like, I can't believe I'm in this Zoom meeting right now with my Mm -hmm. husband like dirty out in the back. He's like, oh, you know, I was eight watching him score touchdowns. You know, it's like, it's pretty cool. (laughs) gotten on board with this and imagine you know these athletes that were 10 20 years before me i mean mm-hmm. it's the sport, sports have changed so much college sports have changed so much the only thing i'll say about my personal beliefs is money's distracting and when you're flashing this yeah. money around kids this age i just don't want it to hurt the the excitement and the pride about being on a team because when money is offered mm-hmm. into the we start getting more focused on me and my family instead of us and our unit and bleeding hard on gold. Um, so how do you control that? And I think a lot of that's up to the coaches, but I mean, everybody comes from such a different financial background that it, it, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a challenge. How do you, how do you control that focus? I guess it must be kind of like the wild west now, right? Because I mean, it's it's like you said, it's 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 all new, um, and then you get the transfer portal now that's involved with with a lot of these sports. So you're getting team turnover, you know, eighty transfers from one team to another or multiple teams. It's 
Yeah. It's insane. It's insane. So you're hurting and helping programs. You're able to reload like the SEs, the Alabamas, you know, Michigans, whoever it may be, the big schools can reload really quickly. But then you see a school like Washington goes to the national championship game this last year, loses uh, Kellen DeBoer to, to Bama. Yep. And yep. then I think like 60 people transferred out or whatever it was. They lost like their complete starting lineup. And so now they're like not even supposed to be decent and they just got done with a national championship bid. So I don't know. I, th- I kind of agree with you. It's It's got to be ironed out. It can't just be free for all every every year. It really is like you said, the Wild West. It's perfect. It's just like, yeah, it, yeah. It was um, too much too fast without a lot of thought behind it, I think. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of thought, <laughs> but it was like, what's the repercussion? Right. How could Let's we- go how- with it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah this works. <laughs> Let's see how this transfer yep. portal looks. <laughs> All right. So I want to get back to some memorable races. So obviously you've had quite a few in your career. I mean, you started off winning like right away, like you said, uh, high school, uh, you know, 1999 Winnipeg, right? Pan Am games, two gold medals. Mm-hmm. And then going to your first Olympics, still in high school, you medal. I mean, <laughs> w- w- besides maybe the first race, like, do you remember the first race, like getting up there uh, on that swim step and like before you're diving in, before that, that sound, that alarm or the whistle goes off? Do you remember yeah. that? Like, what are some memorable moments that you can give somebody out there to give a taste of what the Olympics is like? Yeah, I mean, I have like, um, <laughs> I have this, it's a joke, but it's not really that funny. I <laughs> there's, I don't, don't have the best memory. Um, but my mom makes me feel better. She's like, well, I think it's like, you have so many memories, you know, you've had so many races and you've been to so many swim mates. I'm like, wait, have I been to this pool before? And they're like, yeah, we were here two years ago. You know? So it's like, ah, the pools kind of smell and look the same and they're eight lanes. And, um, <laughs> you know, same I feel like, line. yeah, yeah, follow that black line. Um, but going to my first Olympics, I guess, sensation that I won't forget is, you know, swimming's not that big in the States. And so there's not that big of a turnout for the competitions. Uh, so when I walked out, my first Olympics was in Sydney, Australia, and swimming's their number one sport in their country. So uh, hmm. to walk out and just to be among so many fans and to be swimming in such a huge uh, uh, like arena with spectators that the standing room only like sold out, like the, the tickets to get, that was a surreal feeling. Like I've never really got nervous before competitions. And as we were paraded out for finals for like the top eight, I was like, holy, you know, it was like, wow, my legs kind of like gave out a little bit, just seeing how many people were in the stands. And then it was like, I'm so used to being able to spot like my parents in the stands because there's just not that many people to weed through. And I'm like, I looked up there and I like, there's no way I can find my parents right now. You know, and it was like, ah, where are they? I want to see them. Uh, so that's like a feeling I'll, I'll never forget. And then, um, I had my first two races there. I finished fourth and sixth. So like, just like miss being on the podium, um, but learned a lot. And then for my third race, I ended up getting bronze and, um, the competitor who won was actually American as well. And she got to, I don't know how she wormed her way into this, but she got to put on the song that she wanted after. And it was girls just want to have fun. And then in Sydney, they played like, we come from the land down under. So there was like those two songs and we were like walking around the pool. And I, I'll just, anytime I hear that girls just want to have fun song, like I'll either text my mom or my mom will text me. And it just gets this like flashback of emotions of walking around the pool <laughs> with my pedal and going through like the, the media and like waving up to the fans mm-hmm. and having the American flag. So it's like that song is a trigger for me, either, you know, either one of those songs. Uh, so those are like some big takeaways. Um, and it's just funny. It's like, you know, silly, silly little things that just make you take you right back there. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the races, there's so much like technical talk for them, but just getting your hand on the wall and, and seeing that you won a medal, it's pretty surreal. Um, and even the ones that I didn't uh, get a medal at, at those games, it was like, wow, I'm 17 and I'm in the finals, you know, and, and, <laughs> of my races too which was like something pretty pretty cool to say um but you know it's just the society that we live in it's like come home with a medal or you know what what are you coming home with you know so having to wrap your mind around that too and keeping perspective and not letting the media get into your mind like oh like you know why not a gold or why didn't you win a medal and everything you know and and trying to keep that mentality locked in and just stay grounded with all that 
Caitlin, what was your favorite uh, stroke? Uh, it looks like you were freestylist. You also butterfly. Those are yeah. two. Like, I mean, which one it's do you like more? Tough call because, um, you know, I, I specialize in individual medley, so that's all four strokes. But, yeah, it would come down to freestyle and butterfly for my best of the yeah. four. Um, you know, yeah. I think butterfly is a really beautiful stroke. Um, and my mom says my butterfly is really pretty. Uh, so I have <laughs> – <laughs> My biggest cheerleader. Um, oh, moms. I, oh, moms. And I, and I love the challenge of the sport. You know, I feel like it, it, you know, it's it's known to be the toughest stroke. And so I kind of pride myself on that. And I saw the 200 butterfly, so it's the longest of it. Um, I saw in like the three most grueling races. So I definitely have some street cred for that or swim cred, if you want to say. Um, but, but freestyle is just, it's natural. You know, it's a very natural stroke. Yeah. Um, there's a lot that goes into it to make it a, a very strong stroke. Um, I'm super hyper mobile, so I'm able to get a, a really strong high vertical catch really early in my stroke, um, which is um, desirable. And it was pretty easy for me to do that just with my body type and um, my flexibility with my strength. Um, and I'm very teachable. Uh, that's what I had some technique coaches like, I'll tell you to do something and you do it. And, um, in my mind, I'm like, well, yeah, but now I do some personal coaching. I'm like, why aren't you doing what I'm telling you? So I get what he's saying now, <laughs> no. you know, I'm like, some people have that, that connection, mind, body, you know, control and some people don't. And so I was just really blessed to really blessed to have like a natural feel for the water and, and just to get it, just to have the, the motor skills to do it. So again, very long no. did answer for you, Mark, but I would probably say butterfly would be, be my butterfly. Favorite. Yeah. 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 Actual it's a beauty. Yeah, it is a tan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so success, you know, this, right? So in part of the move to change, we talk about the little small details and you got to get really good at the small things to have success on the large. So yeah. I'm just curious as a swimmer, um, you know, give, give us an example of something like you had to work on that was really tiny. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something small might've been angle of a foot or a kick. Yeah. Something that really as a, a swimmer has to do to get real, to add that extra, you know, uh, just that extra, you know, burst to get a better time or whatever. What, what, give, give us an example of some small things you had to focus on. That's a great question. I mean, everything is so minute and, you know, it comes down to one one hundredth of a second in the end. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say it, timing with breathing is really, really important for, you know, freestyle mm -hmm. butterfly and brushstroke. Um, a lot of times let's just take freestyle. That's the most natural um, and known sport or stroke, but um, just, you know, where you take that breath, how you take that breath over your shoulder and your arms not covering your head and your head's, you know, in line with your body. Yeah. Um, so just making sure that the, the timing of your breath is, is a really um, big, but little thing to work on. Um, and for most elite swimmers, the um, bilateral breathe on both sides, but you're naturally going to be more comfortable to one side to another. Uh, so yeah. make sure that there's no hitch or hesitation when you go to your non-dominant side. So I would have a, a tendency to have a little bit of a lag when I go to my left side because it wasn't as natural for me to get to it. So I that mm -hmm. with my technique coach was something that we worked out a lot in college um, because I swam the events where you have enough time to see where you are. So when you're breathing to both sides, you can make sure that you're where you should be in the race and there's nobody ahead of you that you aren't seeing underwater and, and just keeping that balance of your stroke. So making sure there's no hesitation or hitch when you're going to your side, that's not as comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Great <laughs> example. Yeah. So important, right. To be that elite athlete, to get there. Sometimes young athletes think, oh, I just got to jump in and swim as fast as I can. I mean, you know, and that's, that's a silly example, <laughs> yeah. but, but to be a, to be Olympic swimmer, they're so intricate. The, the, the details of what you did, and yeah. what you, uh, you know, what you had to work on and make comfortable things that weren't comfortable that you had to make them part of your, your, you know, just make, make them more comfortable so you could just, you know, naturally do it and not have to think about it. Right. I mean, that's right. part of that, that whole thing. It's really important. I want to ask you about, um, okay. So Jason, and I actually were looking at some old, uh, video YouTube, uh, of your in 2004, um, Summer Olympics in Greece, you were part of, uh, you, you, you know, you had, uh, you won three more gold medals, a silver medal and a four, 400 meter individual medley, a bronze medal on the 400 meter freestyle and a gold medal in the four by 200 meter freestyle relay. And we just watched that. That was an amazing race. Thank and, you. <laughs> uh, you guys, you guys actually 
dominated. I love this. You actually, a uh, long time East German record, right? You beat him by over two seconds, which was incredible. World record. I mean, it had to be amazing to be a part of that. I guess uh, my, my bigger question is like mentally, you, you jump in, you're the fourth leg of that relay. Um, <laughs> and you guys are on a pace to do, you know, it's like, what's going through your mind as you, you know, as you, as that third swimmer's coming, I don't remember who was the third, who was come, who was the third? Uh, Carly she Piper. Was, it's funny. I was like, Piper was, so she was coming to you. What's going on in your mind is you're on that stand and you're, you're the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you remember? It, or does yeah, it all go blank? It, it, it was, uh, it was, it's interesting too, because actually that day I swam the 200 butterfly, like, sorry, you guys, um, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> can you guys hear that? It's so loud right now. Yeah. You guys, yeah. no worries. Oh, good. It's all good. Good. Ah, good. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> that, so as that day was an interesting day for me because I swam the 200 butterfly before that relay and the 200 butterfly is a very taxing, hard race. And, um, yeah. I was actually the top seed going into that for finals and I wasn't used to that. I wasn't ready for that. It was, I was kind of shocked of it. And I ended up getting a best time, but I finished fourth. And so I got out of the pool and I was, I was pretty pissed. I was like, oh man, yeah, like good. just, oh, I was fired up. And um, I didn't have much time between the 200 butterfly and the 400 IM. And so uh, I was lucky that my college coach was also the Olympic coach. So, so he was there. Coach Schubert came up to me and he was just like, just get it out of your head, swim it out. And he was like, he's like, I like when you have a bad swim. I was like, why? And it wasn't even a bad swim. Like I still went a best time. He's like, because you get more fired up for your next one. And I was like, <laughs> and so he's like, channel that run. energy, like put that energy towards this next race. And um, I had never been on an international relay before, but I was having, and I had qualified. I had done the, the work to be on that relay team, but it was new for me. Um, and not only was I going to be on this relay team, but they were like, I think it was the day of or the night before they're like, and you're going to be the anchor. And I was like, wow, oh, like, man. wow, what, Big what job. A trip, like what an honor, you know? And then I was also like, are you sure about this? <laughs> you know, like I've never really done relay exchanges. Like I just don't have a lot of relay um, experience because I was a distance swimmer and that's considered more of a mid distance to a sprint race. Um, and so I remember being behind the blocks and being like really fired up when they announce your team to like, you know, we raised our hands together and I'm out there with just total legends with Natalie Coughlin, who's just like, you know, before Katie Ledecky, the most decorated American swimmer. And she's just so cool, calm and confident and just a great leader. And she's just very poised. And, you know, she told us her game plan and she's like, you know, I'm going to go out a little bit slow and controlled, but I'll bring it back and don't get nervous. I'm like, Oh gosh, just give me a lead, you know? And, um, but then I, I just like sat down, like, cause I was still getting that last race out of me and everybody's behind the blocks, like jumping up and down. I was just like chilling, like on the ground, like taking it all in because I was fourth. I had the time. And then Natalie did exactly what she said. Like she, she like dove in and she was like, kind of like behind. And I was like, let's go. Nat. And she picked it up and just started just dominating her leg. And then it just, we just kept building off of that, building off of that. Then yeah, I was on the block and getting ready to go off the blocks. And I was like, Oh my gosh, here we go. And the thought <laughs> crossed my mind, like, don't fall start. Don't DQ. Like you have a gold medal <laughs> on a silver platter right now, you know? And I joked that I probably had like the slowest relay exchange of like all of Olympic history, just because I was like, I am not going to chance this, you know, yeah. um, so went in and it's, it's, a it's a hard task because you go in and you have to control your energy and your nerves and your excitement. It's really easy to go in and just spin your wheels and then just not be able to bring it home. So really having to like rein in that energy and, and just stick to the race plan of like not ex overexerting yourself just because you're so excited. Uh, so I felt really strong and in control. And, you know, I, I knew that we, I knew that we had the gold medal on a silver platter unless, you know, I, I couldn't finish, but I didn't really know the world record time. I'm not a big times person. I'm not a big record uh, person. 
somebody just kind of mentioned it to me before we raced. Like, oh, it'd be awesome if you guys broke that record. I'm like, what record? <laughs> you know, like it just was yeah. not yeah. the way that I registered. It's just like, let's do a best time. Let's win this thing, you know? And then um, when I was coming home, I saw like the excitement of the crowd. Cause as you're breathing, you're like looking over and my coaches were going wild. And I felt like I could see the arena kind of standing up. And I'm like, well, this has got to be a good sign, you know, or maybe a lot of people, a lot of times people don't really root for the Americans when you're not in America. Yeah. So I was like, you know, yeah. what is everybody doing? And we got to the wall mm -hmm. and I looked up and it was like USA first and we're just going crazy. And then it said like WR and I'm like, WR, you are, you know, <laughs> hopefully that's not <laughs> really weak, you know? And so, uh, I, I remember cause like my teammates are on the, the ledge of the pool. So they're pretty high up for me and I'm down low and they're all celebrating. And I'm just like, Natalie, Natalie, is that a world record? And she's like, yes. <sighs> and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and it was just a <laughs> real great. celebration, but one of the coolest things about that too, obviously breaking the world record, but like um, going back to what you said, Mark, we broke the oldest world record in the history books and it was the last East German women's record mm. that stood. Yeah. And so wiping that from the history books was just so historic and legendary Huge. that I felt like we had a lot of respect from our competitors. Like the Australians yeah. came over to us, the Japanese came over to us. Like we were on the cover of like every newspaper back in the States, like last East German record that is known to be a doping record, but they couldn't get it off the books because it wasn't wow. broke. Didn't ask me about that. So we broke it to the day of being set 17 years previously. So that mm. was just, I mean, to win the gold, to break a world record, but to break that world record was just, it was so special and just so much pride, like so much pride went into yeah. that. Um, and I had never, yeah. you know, never had broken a world record, never broke a world record again, but to then be on the podium when the flag goes up and was standing, it's crazy because when you get to the Olympics, you guys are, we're, we're a team, but when I was swimming in college or I was swimming um, it, uh, like just nationally, like those are girls I race against, you know, I race against Natalie, mm -hmm. I race against Dana, I race against Carly, but then here we are compiling this relay that just did this like iconic moment in the sport. So it's just kind of interesting, you know, how, how the, the sport, um, develops throughout the seasons. And I mean, Natalie went to Cal Berkeley and we grew up, she's NorCal. I'm so Cal. I mean, I had to race that girl all the time. Yeah. And I'll, quite frankly, I don't like this girl. And then like, as we got older, I was like, I have so much <laughs> I, we became, you know, good friends, still in touch today, and still like to share that moment that we have as her yeah. as the lead off and me as the anchor. That's just something that will we will just always have that bond for the rest of our life. Yeah, yeah, amazing race! Congratulations, that was really fun to watch. Um, Thank you so much. I remember, yes. I remember yeah, <laughs> I remember watching like live because I love watching like Olympic swimming. Like I think it's, I know I know nothing about swimming, right? Like I raced a little <laughs> bit as a kid. At like Newport Harbor High School, not when I was in high school, but they have like the the yeah. youth swimming there and totally. like, yeah. But it was, so it was super fun. But it's incredible to watch. Just like you guys, as as an athlete, like it's just a different world. Because I mean, it's one thing. Like most of the rest of the sports, right? You're you're either in the water or you're you're on a court or a field or something like that. Like being able to swim at that speed for that amount of time, especially like you as a longer distance swimmer. And being able to do sprints as well, because you did some short course, you won a bunch of medals as well in short course. So you can do it, but it's incredible. It's it's really incredible to watch. So yeah. kudos to you for being able to do yeah. that. It's incredible. There's a joke within like the swimming community. They're like, we would love to see the Olympics. But then they just put in like Joe Blow from down the street and have them in the <laughs> really see how much faster an Olympic athlete is like either around the track or in the pool and just put some like average guy off the street and put him in the pool and see the difference. Yeah. I was like, Oh gosh, that would be like an awesome reality show or something. <laughs> yeah. That would be funny. Okay, so I have a, I have a sad quick story relating to swimming. Oh, um, so in college um, I had back surgery from football and so I was doing my rehab while the team was out at spring ball practice. So our, our swimming pool, our competitive pool is behind the football field mm -hmm. and uh, of our practice field. So like for my rehab from back surgery, the first thing I could do was swim. Like oh, that was okay. the first thing they wanted me to do is to go and yeah. hey, get in the pool. Like instead of being out on the field, like, you know, stretching or doing core work, like after I got approved to do start physical activity, like, Hey, get in the pool. I want you to swim, you know, 
X amount of laps, mm -hmm. you know, and you start off, you know, in breaststroke or whatever you want to do. But as I had to progress towards freestyle, like the, after like a lap or two, like I was dizzy. Like I was oh. dizzy. It's like, it's so much harder than people realize. And I wasn't like trying to go super fast or anything. And obviously I'm not in, in shape at that point either, but it's incredible. Like the amount of, of capacity, like lung capacity or um, just stamina you have to have to even swim a few laps well yeah. is remarkable. It's pretty surreal. So I took two professional hockey players and a MMA fighter. And I think those two sports, I mean, the conditioning and the shape that you have to be mm -hmm. in. I took them to a mm -hmm. pool. They asked me to take them for a swim workout. They were toasted after two laps. Like, I'm not joking. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I was like, and I obviously, I know that about our sport, but then when you compare it to athletes in shape, mm -hmm. professional hockey players, professional MMA, yeah. and I'm just like, whoa, it's so different. And like, and that's what I try to explain to people. Like I can swim all day, but I can't run all day. And runners can run all day, but they can't swim all day. You know, and it's mm -hmm. like, and I can swim easy. And a lot of people can't swim easy, you know? And people are like, mm -hmm. oh, do you still have to for a workout? I was like, no, because I have to push myself so hard because I'm so efficient. I don't really burn calories because I can do this easily. Mm. I can run easily, you know? So it, it is a very unique sport. The cardio of it is, you know, holding your breath, catching your breath and, and, and a full body workout for sure. And, and it's funny too, because like after I was out of sports or out of swimming, and trying just to stay in shape, I had to remind myself that I don't have to hold my breath. Like, hey, like, just breathe. <laughs> like, I'm so used to holding my breath and working out. So I'm like at the gym, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <you're pushing. laughs> yeah. Do you think all your, do you think all your, so not all your setbacks, but all, as athletes, we all have setbacks. You've had your fair share of setbacks. We've talked about a few. Um, speak a little bit to, going and and trying to to attain that third olympic Olympic games two thousand eight right and then you decide to retire after that right. um mentally physically, how were you feeling at that point like was it a weird feeling like hey, I think it's time to hang it up like what was going through your mind yeah, that's a great question um so I always thought I would just be done after u s c so I would swim my four years and I would be done. Um, I liked the sport, but there was a lot that I didn't love. And I felt like the injury took a lot out of me. Um, and I just figured, you know, I'll get my degree and I'll be done. But then when I signed with Nike, it was a four and a half year contract. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll just keep going. And, and this is my job. But then it was, um, it was interesting at that time, because there wasn't a lot of places for women to continue their swimming career. So I didn't really know where to go train. Um, there wasn't a lot of options. So um, I ended up packing up and moving to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I swam on the elite postgrad team there. And that was a team that was Michael Phelps and his coach. So wow. Bob Bowman was the head coach at the men's Michigan team. And then he started a postgrad team that was like all men on the national team. And so I basically had to like ask permission to come train there because he didn't train women, but I didn't have really anybody that was um, the right training environment for me or training partners, but Phelps and I swam all the same events. And then two of my buddies from USC were going there. Um, I had already been in Ann Arbor uh, for a couple of trips. I knew it was a great town. And um, I was like, it's time to get a little uncomfortable and move outside of the Southern California bubble. Uh, so I moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that rocked my world, uh, having winters and being away from home and um, new friends too, because I wasn't going to school there. I was just swimming with a bunch of guys and it was like, okay, how do I make friends? How do I make friends outside of swimming? Um, you know, I was living by myself. It was just, it was an interesting time of my life. I feel like I grew up a lot as a woman um, and just uh, matured a lot being out there. I had never trained so hard in my life, um, but I also had never really just swam before. So that was weird too. And I didn't really love that. I always had a different distraction of school or involved in school, you know, I always had something else going on, but I yeah. was just swimming. Um, I was a professional athlete, so I was traveling and I was doing appearances and photo shoots and, you know, the requirements that go with that. Um, but it was hard. I was sick a lot out there with the allergies and the environment and my, with my allergies and just um, asthma. And um, I felt like my body didn't recover as well. I think I like I, I knew I was going to have to train hard, but they, you definitely have to do some things differently between men and women. And I wasn't doing anything really different than the guys. I did everything that they did. Um, and I just felt like I was hurt a lot, sick a lot, tired a lot. 
Um, I felt like my body was starting to put on weight more. Um, and I just, I, I kind of ebbed and flowed my whole time there. Just one good meat, not a good meat, good meat, not a good meat. And I was just starting to not love it as much. Um, I knew mm. for sure I wanted to be done in 08. Um, I knew as soon as I started going to swim meets and I wasn't excited to be at swim meets that it was time to be done because that's why I love swimming. I love to race. Yeah. And then I found myself yeah. getting to meets and just been like, oh, when is this going to be over? You know, and um, mm. I just wasn't having the success I was having younger. I wasn't rebounding as fast. I wasn't having as much fun. Um, the guys on my team were great. They were awesome. We have like so many laughs and memories and it was pretty surreal to be with this group of men. It, it was a pretty impressive group that we had. Um, but I don't know. I just, I just was ready for the next chapter. And then I had a really good 2007 and things were starting to look better for 2008. And then about, I think it was like two months before the Olympic trials, I blew out my knee. And then two weeks before Olympic trials, I had a severe upper respiratory infection. And I was like, yeah, I think that's about it. So uh, my mom was in town and she's like, you know, we could just pack up and move you home. And that's that. I'm like, no, I want to go to like my last meet. I want to go to my last Olympic trials. I want to go out on my terms and race one more time. And so I went to trials. Yeah. You know, and, and, and she said that from a very loving place. I think we are all just very realistic. We're like, Oh, this isn't gonna, this isn't gonna happen. And the the hat trick's not in store. Um, and I was realistic about that, but I still just wanted to just go one more. Like it was kind of like the last hurrah. Um, and I felt like an obligation to Nike. They were so good to me. They're so good to my family. Like we had the most incredible experience together and I wanted to go represent them there. And, um, yeah, I mean, just wasn't in the cards, but it was kind of crazy. Like I kept like lived to fight another day at the meet. Like I thought I'd be done and I qualified. I was like, Oh, I thought I'd be done. I was like planning my <laughs> return to me and like, just wanted to go grab a beer. And everybody's like, Oh, Kayla, you made finals. I was like, Oh my gosh. You know? Um, <laughs> and everybody was super supportive and really kind. Like if anybody can do it, Caitlin, you can do it. You're such a racer. And I really appreciated that. But I was also like, <laughs> It's just, I was like still on antibiotics. Like it was just not going to happen. So yeah, like my best place at the Olympic trials was eighth and you have to be either top two for an individual or top six for a relay. And um, I remember getting out of the pool and just, I I felt like I just felt the weight of my shoulders just off and I, it was very bittersweet. I was like, just sat in the water. I was actually in the water with Natalie Coughlin and it's like, I'm like, I'm going to miss it. She's like, I'm going to miss you. I'm like, I'm going to miss you too. Like, it was just a very surreal moment. And then I remember leaving and I got like a standing O and I was like, for me, like, I just you know, <laughs> missed the Olympic team. And, and people knew that that was my last race. And then NBC pulled me aside and did an interview. And that was pretty surreal too. And mm. it was definitely very emotional, but it was like emotions of like relief, sad, bummed, excited, like just all the motions that you can imagine. And that was it. That was, that was the end of, of, of the career. So I was hoping for a third Olympics, but third Olympic trials was pretty impressive. And, um, everything that I had kind of just gone through and experienced. And, um, I think it makes my story relatable. You know, I feel like when you hear from billionaires or world record holders or people that have achieved these amazing feats, they just don't seem relatable. But I feel like with all the ups and downs that I had in my career and that, you know, I, I, it didn't go perfectly for me. Like that's life. Like that's, that's relatable. Mm -hmm. You know, I always joke, like Phelps was so talented. Like you could just like push that guy in the pool and he would break a world record, you know? And like, that's not relatable. He is just on another planet of a specimen as, Mm -hmm. as as an athlete. Um, and, you know, I, obviously I know what, I, what I've accomplished is um, pretty amazing and, and not a lot of people can say that, but I also feel like my, my career, my path was, is relatable. Absolutely. That's for sure. I mean, I think that transition for anybody who's had success like you, it sounds like it was uh, easier maybe, but, you know, again, I'm sure later after your career was over, as you're watching somebody swim, you're probably like, Gosh, I could still do that. I could probably beat them or something like that. You know I, mean? like, I don't know. Maybe that didn't happen to you. I know for me in my career after eight years in the NFL, I was I was surprised how hard it was to trans you know, to transition out. Um I didn't realize how much my identity had been in, in sports. Like I was and I was a guy preaching about it, like, hey, you know, yeah, I know it's gonna sport. end, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it was like rowdy hit. It was like, whoa, I mean, well, now now who am I? Um right. Now, what am I going to do? You know, and I'm sure you had probably some of that in there, but it sounds like you were, you were pretty level headed and just knew it was time to, to roll and to move on. Yeah. I was definitely okay with like giving it up. And I think, you know, ever since then it's been, 
different seasons of my life where, um, you know, I do find myself uh, in my identity of sports, you know, coming into an Olympic year. I try to use that to my advantage to get more speaking engagements, more appearances. Um, I have more opportunities with USA Swimming. And then, you know, again, you strike when the iron's hot and then swimming's popular every four years. And then it kind of disappears. And then, you know, I find myself in these unique, different career opportunities. Um, But it's funny what you say about like your physique. It's like, I look back on, you know, towards the end of my career, I was like, gosh, I feel better today than I did then. My nutrition is better. My sleep Um, is better. My body feels better. You know, I obviously don't, I know realistically, I couldn't put in the work that I would need to be an elite athlete, but I just feel better all around. And I think that's just age, that's maturity, that's technology. That's, you know, my husband being a nutritionist, like there's so many different components of that, but there's like some days, you know, in my workout class, I tend to get like really competitive. I'm like, yeah, I feel like I still got it. Like I still got it. (laughs) He's like, I know you're the most competitive in spin class. I'm like, yeah, I won today. He's like, I know you did. (laughs) That's great. Oh, that's funny. Well, your husband, uh, he was an athlete, right? Football, uh, as I understand. So he was pretty successful too. You probably, you guys probably compete pretty well together. (laughs) He's a total stud. He's so like any, any sport he does, he's so talented and still to this day. And he's like in the best shape of his life right now too. And uh, yeah, we have a, (laughs) we have um, friendly competitions, I guess you could say, but we both enjoy (laughs) different exercises and different workouts. And for a while, I was and I was like, I don't so know. Will he, yeah. Will he get in the pool with you? Will he get in there and challenge you and like talk yeah. trash about pools? That's a great question because everybody's like, oh, do you still swim? I was like, no, but my husband loves swimming. So Pete always wants to go swim. He's like, come with me, come with me. Oh, like, he does. So he's like, here I am. I thought I married this Olympic swimmer and we could do all these swim workouts together. And he's like, you <laughs> no, never no, want to swim with me. Come on, I've show been, me swimming. People are always like, what's it like swimming with your wife? He's like, it's very humbling. And he's like, I'll be in fins, snorkel, everything. And she's in no fins, no snorkel, goes right past me. <laughs> We uh we go to Captain <laughs> we go and we swim just out in the ocean and we'll go to shore for dinner and everybody's like, Oh Pete, we saw you out there with your fins and your wife without it just totally kicking your butt. He's like, Yeah, you should try to <laughs> get there too. You know, like he's very cool about it. But he always gives him uh, grief about it. They're like, Yeah, we saw your fins and she wasn't wearing them and she was way ahead of you. <laughs> that's we all have humbling for a husband. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's good. So, all right. So last question here for you before we let you go, but so what's the, what, in your opinion, what's the future of swimming look like? Maybe uh, technological advancements, competitiveness in the global scale, TV rights deals. I mean, it seems like, I mean, you were just down in in Chile, right? A few months ago for, was it the Pan Am games? Is that what it was? The Pan Am games. Yeah. So, so what, uh, so what does that look like? What's the future of swimming? Is it bright? Are you excited to be a part of it? What, what, what is the swimming landscape like? So, you know, I feel like with anything, technology is always evolving. First swimming, it comes down to one one hundredth of the second and how aerodynamic yeah. you can be through the water. So the technology of suits, goggles, caps, how you get off the block. They've, they've changed the blocks, the starting blocks, the backstroke starts. Um, so that keeps evolving. Uh, you know, I think the sport of swimming is interesting. Like I said, it's popular every four years, but it just really doesn't get a lot of, a lot of love in between that time. Um, I think, you know, I see it a lot when I read like the swim comments, like now that we don't have Phelps, like in our sphere, in the pool, I don't mm-hmm. think we have as much interest as we've had in the past. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been around for so many years. Um, you know, you have dominant stars like Katie Ledecky and Caleb Dressel that were getting a lot of attention the last Olympics, but the Phelps was on another level and he did so much for our sport. And we haven't seen another athlete like that since in that sense. And that's not to dilute Katie Ledecky because she's incredible in what she's accomplished. Um, but you know, she's a quieter gal. She's a little bit more soft-spoken. Like she's not like in that kind of public eye that, that Phelps was, um, Caleb Dressel has done a lot for this sport, but you know, the last couple of years, he hasn't been as dominant. He took a little bit of a step back from the sport. Um, but he's making the little surgeons right now. So it, it'll be, interesting you know our viewership um kind of teeters uh we are moving to a much larger capacity um uh, audience capacity for the olympic trials that i'm really excited to be the live mc um our trials will be inside of the indianapolis colts uh stadium so that'll be really nice. 
for our sport. Uh, but, you know, ticket prices had to go up. Now people are complaining about the ticket prices. So there's just, you can never please everybody. Um, you know, Team USA is strong, our women's team specifically. So that'll be really fun to watch in Paris. Uh, not to say that our men aren't, but our women have just been really dominant recently. Our men are a little bit younger and we kind of have some holes in our roster compared to against the world. Um, so Ooh. it'll be interesting to see how Paris goes. And, you know, as an American, I think everybody's really excited to have the U S um, or to have the, the games on U S soil in 2028. So that'll be pretty special, especially for us in orange County that we'll have it here in our backyard. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. So I, I stay involved in, in a capacity that's more of a commentator or a, an MC or a host. I don't get into as much as like the technical side. And that just wasn't me as a swimmer. And I'm not as much of a swim nerd as some of the people out there. And, um, you know, I follow the swimmers as um, I go to events and get to interview the athletes as they make the team. But there's always some surprises, some young up and comer. And that's always really fun and really special to see. Um, you'll see that on the women's side a little bit more than the men, because I think women have, you know, that success at younger ages more typically than the men do. Um, so it, it's going to be an interesting next few months. And in our swimming world and, and just moving forward. I mean, going back to college is kind of interesting because so many international swimmers come and train in the States. So we're training them mm. and then we race them internationally. Mm. So there's always been mm. a little bit of that controversy of that. Like we train so many foreign swimmers here on us soil mm. and then we go to international meets and you know, we're not as dominant as we used to be. Like there used to be like no question, like team USA always the yeah. best. And there's definitely more competition that I'm seeing now than I had um, back in our day. I mean, that we always had somebody special to race against, but it wasn't like a country was like challenging us for the medal count like they are now. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> No, it just seems like, I mean, it seems like people like you and Natalie, uh, Amanda, I mean, there's been so many great, uh, women swimmers, but also again, like Michael Phelps and, uh, Ryan Lochte and all just, there's so many world-class athletes. Um, all of you have pushed swimming on the, na on the national, but international stage as well, yeah. where all of those people are like, I want to do what they're doing. Like, I want to yeah. come to the U S I want to yep. train with the best coaches, best technology, yep. That's why this is the world's greatest country, in my opinion, right? Like business wants to come in, sports yep. athletes from all over the world want to come in. They want to play in our leagues. They, you know, yep. it's, it's such a wonderful place to be. So, um, but all thanks to people like you, Caitlin, that, that have yeah. kind of pushed the sport and, and uh, I want to give back to, to the next generation as well. Yeah. And I think too, like, which I, I'm a big supporter of and, and, and get our education to get the uh, education opportunity. So if you can do your sport and get the education, um, that's pretty special to get that in the United States. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And Mark and I really appreciate you being on and I uh, can't wait to see what you do in the future. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks guys. It was so fun. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.